what I do, I'm doing for me. You know, a lot of people who want to stand up and, and try and save the world. Well, me, I want to save myself because that's the most important thing. Me being strong, being healthy, not to end up, you know, like my parents who are sick, who, you know, and it's hard to say if, if my father was a dog, you know, you'd be thinking like, you know, the best thing for him is to put him down because he's just living in a, in a 24 hour, seven day a week nightmare that he can't get out of. So what I do, I do, you know, for myself, you know, I'm 58, I'm not 28. I got to tell you, man, you're a, you're an impressive uh, you're an impressive guy for uh, unbelievably. You're 58. You look you look 20 38 38. Okay, <laughs> good for you, man. That's awesome. So, anyway, you're in the UK right now, correct? Yep. I was reading you lived lived in Switzerland for a while, and you're, you're uh, in phenomenal shape, and you're an, you're an inspiration for. I, I, I just started following you on Instagram a while ago, and I said, man, this guy's doing some good stuff, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm a few, I'm 55, so you got a couple of years on me, but you're, you're definitely, uh, you know, it keeps me on task. So tell us, uh, you go with Mike or Michael, what's your preference? Michael's fine. Anything. Don't mind. Yeah, I know, I'm the same way. I get people call me every kind of name in the book, so I don't really worry about it. But so Michael, tell us a little bit about your background. You got an interesting background. So for the last 15 years prior to coming back to the uh, UK in 2019, I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Excuse me. Hello? That's it. Um, I lived in Switzerland for 15 years. Um, I was full-time ski instructor, uh, bodyguard, personal trainer, ran training classes. Um, so that was for the last 15 years before I came back to the UK in 2019. Uh, studied martial arts since I was a kid studied in Japan, in Israel, so I teach that. Um, and currently I'm working on a carnival retreat in Scotland and uh, uh, my accountability program on Facebook. Very nice. So, uh, you know, as someone who's just started in the martial arts at this age, I, I have a lot of respect for that. I, you know, I don't know, are you still actively, I know, I know you're doing a lot of working out, but are you still actively participating and do you do train regularly in the martial arts still? Not really. The last time I was in Japan was in 2015. And then in 2017, I had a bad ski crash and I had a complete rupture of my supraspinatus, mm -hmm. had surgery. And the martial art that I study is lots of throwing. And so it's been quite difficult to sort of get back into, into that. Yeah, I, I, I can see. I'm, I'm you know, depending on the night and who I go with, depends on how sore I am the next day. And it's kind of like I, every day, regardless, I get up and on my bike and do sprints. And it's like some days getting out there is tougher than others, but you know, you're pretty consistent. But how did you, so carnival retreat, that's pretty interesting. So first of all, how did you sort of get interested in a sort of a meat-based or carnivore diet? What, what drove you that way? <clears throat> I think I've always been meat-based. You know, even when I was a kid, all I wanted to eat was steak and chips. I hated vegetables. Um, and so going through, you know, my life and in my early twenties, I started to experiment with a whole load of stuff. I mean, I've been vegetarian, I've been vegan. I was vegetarian for three years, vegan for six months, uh, protein, did, carb, let me just, combining. Let me interrupt you there. Cause you said, you know, I hated vegetables as a kid. I mean, how did, how did you take the leap that I'm going to go vegan then? I mean, that seems completely, <clears throat> you know, counter instinctual, I suppose. Well, it was, it was part of a process. So in my early 20s, I was starting to discover a little bit about nutrition, um, how, I, how I felt. And back then, there was a, you know, fr uh, doing loads and loads of fruit, juicing, protein, carbohydrate, uh, combining. And it, it became just like, almost like a natural progression. So if I, if I cut out that, and then I went into becoming, it was for no moral reason, becoming a vegetarian and uh and then i wanted to try you know cutting out dairy so i naturally became a, a a vegan and this was back in the late eight in the late 80s so there was no google 
had to buy books, had to go to the library. And to be fair, I did it, I did actually very, very well. Um, I had no negative effects as such, but what got me back was bacon, the smell of bacon sandwiches. <laughs> That's a gateway drug to trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but it's interesting because, uh, well, a lot of people, well, well, uh, you would, I'm, I'm assuming you've always been sort of healthy and, and worked out and, and been involved with strength training and fitness your whole yeah. life. Yeah. Say, so. Yeah. That, that, that can mitigate a lot of the damage. And some people will say like, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll point to me and say, well, the only reason you're not dead is because you work out regularly, you know, and, and say, well, that's why carnivore diet's bad. But the only people that survive are the ones that work out all the time, which I would argue is not a good argument personally but so you so you went vegan and you tried all these different diets so how do we get to a meat-based diet now well it naturally went back to eating meat again eating meat and fish um becoming more high protein um and again it was just it was it was a progression and probably about i would say probably about the late 90s atkins uh came about I know Atkins have been going on before then, but it sort of, uh, it came to my view. And, and I just thought that makes sense. It made sense to me to, to cut out carbs. And what I noticed was, you know, in my twenties, and I think when you're young, you can do loads of stuff and it doesn't have a, a negative effect to a degree. As soon as I got into being 30, then I found that, I was you know, starting to put on a little bit more weight. What I was doing in my 20s, I couldn't do when I was in my 30s. And so doing the Atkins or cutting out carbs then, it just worked for me. It, you know, it was, it was my type of diet just to basically eat meat, you know, and not, not eating any crap. And so it's been, it's been, like, it's been a, uh, you know, a progression, you know, trying things out, et cetera, et cetera. And I like to cook. I like to eat. I like to eat nice food uh, yeah, and experimenting. Know. Yeah, I've seen some. You, you, you've got some very nice videos. You're cooking some really wonderful looking uh, steaks and stuff on, on your on your Instagram, and uh, uh, so I can see that they look delicious. It makes me hungry when I when I see some of your stuff going on there. Well, you know, I just think that if you're going to eat it, make it as, as best as you can, because you know, there's nothing for me. I do it every day. I want, not that I want every day to be special, but I want every time I eat to think, well, that tastes good. You know, I see lots of stuff on, on some of the groups on Facebook where people are posting stuff and it's like, I won't eat that. You know, you've got, to, okay, you might have to do it today, but can you do it for tomorrow, the day after, the day after, three months time, six months time, one year, two year, you know, for me, it's got to be tasty. So, yeah, I agree. I, I just had a nicely sous vide and then and then nicely seared ribeye just moments before I came here, you know, just kind of in preparation for this. And it's, you know, I've gotten to where I'm, I'm pretty competent at cooking steaks and making them taste good. And, yeah, I agree. It's something if you're going to, you should enjoy what you eat. You shouldn't. It diet. makes me feel good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When it, when you, when, you get, when it turns out well, you know, and you start to hone your technique, there's nothing worse than ruining a nice steak. I mean, that's, that's just very uh yeah. very sort of depressing so you um uh so these days i mean you said you're not doing the martial arts currently but you're you're training very hard and yeah are you finding that a relative lack of carbohydrates has inhibited you from getting strong staying strong working out has what's been your experience with that not at all um you know i i trained generally trained fasted that for me not for any other reason is that I prefer it that way. Um, I don't have any you know, energy uh, lack of, you know, when I ski, when I'm with clients, I don't, you know, I, I ski fasted. I can ski all day long and not eat. You know, we're not, I know we're not talking about fasting, but just, just that the body's ability to, by not living on carbohydrates, not eating carbohydrates, not, not living on sugar, it's just, it's just great for me. So I can train uh, relatively hard without any, I don't feel any lack of energy. And I train, you know, I've got a big dog. I'm always out walking with him. You know, sometimes I have to chase him. You know, so 
Yeah. We're, I mean, so I guess, cause I'm, I think, I don't know what mountains are in the UK. I think Ben, Ben Nevis is the biggest mountain in the UK or something like that, or Scotland or something like that. Where, you can't ski in Scotland, can you? Or do you, do you have to go to France and Switzerland to ski? I've, I've, I've never skied in Scotland, but you can, you can ski in Scotland. Okay. It's not the same as skiing in Switzerland, sure. um, but you, but you can ski in Scotland. So you're still, are you still, so are you still doing actively ski instruction or what do you, what do you yep. do for your, for your sort of day-to-day work other than working out and eating steak? <laughs> kind of like, you. well, you know, I don't talk about it much, but one of the reasons I, I, I moved back was to take care a little bit more with, with my parents who both got dementia. Uh, dad's completely disabled through a stroke. He has really severe dementia and, you know, being at my age, my mother's 94 Wow. That's 90. And managing that is, uh, has its, you know, a few complications. Yeah, no, that's a full time. And that's one of the problems with, uh, uh, the d- dementia. And we're going to see a lot more of it and particularly people younger and younger as the diet continues to uh, devolve into, into what we are now, we're going to see more and more people with dementia and, and people having to deal with it. And it's tough to have a full time job and have a, a demented spouse or parent or whatever and it takes a lot of time and effort for sure um do you uh find that uh so tell me about the carnival retreat what's uh, what uh, what's the sort of uh in- inspiration for doing that so there's there's a there's a few um but the main inspiration was i i had a friend of mine last year and he said to me mike i want to do what you do he said, if I can find somewhere, can we go away for a month? I want to eat what you do. I want to breathe how you do. I want to train how you do. And I said, I said, that's great, but I don't think I can do a month. Maybe we can find somewhere for a week. Anyway, so I started looking at various places. And I was just finding these most beautiful places in Scotland, ex-hunting lodges. And I thought, I know I can cook. I know I can cook for five, six people. I know what I'm doing with training. I know what I'm doing with breath work, meditation, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've been teaching for a long time and I just thought if I can do it for one, I can do it for six, seven people. And I just thought that's what I'm going to do. So I found this amazing lodge in Scotland in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and put it on. So has that, has that occurred yet or is that about to occur? Yeah, that the first the first one was in last October and I'm just now putting the plan in for the next one next this October. How how did that I assume it went well? I mean, if you're doing it again, did you did you get some results with the people that decided to, to jump in jump on board? Well, it was fantastic. The problem was is that when I did it and started promoting it, we were still in lockdown. So I was getting lots of people saying, oh, I'd love to do it. I want to do it. I'm ready to do it. And what what happened is the time that I started posting it, it offered people a little bit of a dream while they were in lockdown. And then lockdown finished. And all these dreams that people had about, I want to get fit. I want to get stronger. I want to start doing something with my diet. Lockdown finishes and they all go back to how they were. And so I had a few issues with that, but it was... The place was fantastic. How I did it was fantastic. It was uh, just great, and the people who turned up just thought it was fantastic as well. What did you What did you cook? I imagine so there were some steaks cooked, but what was it? What was it? What was it? What, what describe what What happened? I mean, three meals a day. So they work out. What time of the day? How did that go? So we did it pretty much as a reflection of, in essence, what I do. So we wake up in the morning, we'd have some tea, have some coffee. And then we'd do some, uh, we'd do some breath work, whatever type of breath work we decided to do. And then after that, we would do some training. So whatever type of training we decided to do. Then after that, we would have breakfast, which would generally be about 11, 12, 12 o'clock. And the breakfast would be loads of steak, loads of eggs, loads of bacon, um, all fantastic uh, produce that I get locally. And then after that, we'd go for a walk, you know, just a, a simple, a simple, a simple walk. And then the afternoon, people could just chill and relax a little bit. Then after that, we'd go for some more walks, maybe a bigger hike. 
and then start getting ready for for dinner and more dinner, beef. Dinner was probably steak, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, that sounds perfect to me. I mean, that's that's pretty reflective of what, what kind of my day looks like. You know, it's usually two meals a day, and again, some sort of exercise several times throughout the day, typically, and, and try not to be sedentary. What uh, you know, I want to ask you about the Krav Maga because that's a, uh, a martial art that's involved with multiple attackers. Is, is that is that my understanding, or can you sort of articulate how that how that differs from, say, karate or jujitsu or some of the other martial arts that are out there? The, the origins of Krav Maga was, it was basically for, for soldiers to how to retain their weapon. So if someone was to attack them, how could they could retain their weapon? You know, it, it's, there isn't a martial art for one attacker or for multiple attackers. Okay. You know, it's, 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 it's impossible to, if someone says, oh, I've got this martial art that's perfect for multiple attackers, I would say, don't give them your money. You know, so, so getting back to the question, like Krav Maga was a very, very aggressive way how to train the Israeli soldiers how to be really aggressive really, really quickly. And it was, it was, it was aggression-based. So techniques in the beginning, I mean, I learned it back in the 80s before anyone knew what it was. And it was very, very rough. Uh, there wasn't techniques as, as there are now. Uh, but it was just, it was more of a very, very rough, very, very aggressive way of uh, mindset and with some techniques. And whoever you went to would have a different, would have a different sort of slant on what they were teaching you. So if you had a guy who'd done karate, he'd be teaching more sort of karate base. If you had a judo guy, there would be more judo type throws. And that's really the essence of Krav Maga. They take bit here they, they look at what works there um yeah i mean i, I guess i can it's almost like a mixed martial arts to, to a degree you know i guess to, to some extent i suppose uh you know and i think you know i i, I run into with what i'm doing with jujitsu a number of guys that are pretty well trained in judo which is a issue when you watch high level judo it's pretty impressive how hard they, they're able to throw people and how effective it's you know you can imagine doing that on concrete you basically kill somebody or close to it with a, with a single throw so well that's that, that that that's the interesting point is that a lot of people they do martial arts mixed martial arts etc cetera, etc cetera. applying that to let's say the street when you're you know when people are being thrown it's you you get thrown on concrete that should finish it you know but when people are doing things on on, on mats etc cetera, etc cetera, their perception of what works and what doesn't work is different than when you're being thrown on concrete. You know, in the same way that traditional martial arts in Japan were done on wooden floors. Being thrown on a wooden floor is a lot different than being thrown on a tatami mat. I know yeah. I've got all the, all the yeah. bruises and broken bones and to prove it. <laughs> No, I mean, you, you spent time as a, as a bodyguard. And so how was that? I mean, was that how, is that a lot of, bo I mean, I imagine it's a lot of just observation boredom and very seldom are you called the task to defend someone. Is that fair to well, say? Or what's it like? I had a, I had a very interesting role in Switzerland. So I would look after skiers. I'd look after VIPs when they came skiing. So I'd be skiing with them and taking them around the mountain. So my job as a bodyguard was a little bit different than your normal uh, perception of, of, you know, of a bodyguard, whether it's high risk in, in the Middle East or just taking someone, uh, a Russian ol oligarch in New York or, or, or something like that. So my job was a little bit different. So, but it, and, so, and, it, and, and it was just more fun. Got it. And so, I mean, I, and again, I... I'm sure the bodyguard role has some interesting stuff, but I mean, is it, do we see a lot of people like truly at risk? You know, I mean, I think there's some people that are very unpopular right now that probably have yeah. a lot of bodyguards around them or something like that. But I mean, how, how uh, often are some of these people truly at risk? I mean, are there, are there people, I mean, there's, you hear all about these crazy people all the time. Is that something that's, uh, you think it's necessary or what are your thoughts? I think some people need it. Um, I think a lot of people don't actually need it, but they have it because 
it's part of the process of, of who they are. You know, the being a celebrity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether they need it or not is, an, is, an, is another matter. Um, but I think if you're a celebrity, if you're in the, in the public eye and you're, and you want to be a celebrity that's um, quite vocal, then it's probably like a, a good thing that they have it. Yeah, so, I, guess, I guess, you know, and I wonder because it seems like mental health and, and you know, you, you imagine the people that, that in, in many cases go after these people, you, know, you look at Ronald Reagan when he was shot by some, you know, crazy, crazy guy, John H was it John Hinckley Jr. I think um, there's more of that though. Now there's more and more people that have mental instability. And I think, you know, part of it is because of our awful, awful nutritional policies and nutri our sorry, nutrition that we have. Do you, do you think that that's becoming a greater need? I think, I think there's a lot more crazy people. For I sure. Fair to say, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I think with yeah, there's a, there's a lot more there's a lot more crazy you know crazy people and it, you know I'm just trying to think of some sort of like analogies like you know I'm I'm, I'm trying to sort of think of like a like a, like like like, a, like an answer but there's just there's just more crazy people and I think people are sicker than they used to be or there's more of them yeah i mean i think the i guess the fortunate thing is they, they often tend to be physically just just have physical <laughs> weakness as well so they're not as much of a threat unless you give them a weapon then they're then they're probably uh you know then there's obviously an issue with that but um what is you know i mean let me ask you this because since you've gone to a like you're you know very much meat based any any benefits cognitively, uh, mental health wise that you can tell? Is it less less stress, or how does that work for you? I just think that I cope better with outside stress. You know, my, I do know that my 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 thinking is really really sort of really clear. I sleep very well. Uh, I recover very well. Um, it's it's hard it's hard to pinpoint, but I just feel I feel really really good. And when I look at people who are my age, who people who are ten years younger, even twenty years younger, even thirty years younger, I know that I feel better than them. And you know, it's like, well, is it because I train? Is it because I do some meditation? Well, that has a part of it. But I know that it's what I eat. Uh, it's it, it's it's I know I know if I eat something that's, you know, let's say off piste, I feel crap. It affects it affects my head completely. You know, yeah. it's, um, yeah. A lot of people comment that you know, particularly people that have been on a sort of a meat based diet for periods of time, they'll say if they go off for the weekend or they literally feel like they've gained 10 years of age or 20 years older and everything hurts and their guts hurt and, 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 and they can't think clearly and they're anxious and depressed. And we see those things pretty frequently. So I'm not, not surprised. What is your, so you're training these days. Cause I mean, you know, I see, you know, you're doing a fair bit of high rep stuff. You're doing some basic heavy movement, a lot of functional training, you know, it's out. It seems like you're always, it's always outside in the backyard. So, uh, is that, so what, what, what are you focusing on? What was your goals when you're training or how does a typical, weeks where the training work for you i've done lots of programs in the past i don't have a program i just train intuitively but i know throughout the week that i'm going to do some squats i'm going to do some deadlifts i'm going to do some form of pressing i have to work around with old injuries etc etc um but i just like to i just like to move and for me the focus is really about maintaining muscle mass it's not about getting bigger it's just maintaining muscle mass, being strong, but also being able to move. You know, it's, I think you said it in um, one of your posts yesterday or the day before, there's lots of people who can be strong 50, 60, 70, but they can't move. And for me, the important thing is to be able to move. If I can move with strength, you know, if I can ski powerfully, and that for, that for me is more is is important. 
I still want to be able to throw someone. I still want to be, if someone wants to throw me, that I can break for, from it. So it's having that resilient strength, that agility type of strength to be able to do, you know, to be able to sprint. If, you know, I go walking with a dog and then I'm walking in these fields and then I decide just to go for a run. You know, I don't normally run, but I just said, okay, I can, I can go for a run. You know, age to me is, I don't think about age. I just want to be able to move, be strong. So my training is just about that. It's doing functional move, compound movements, um, maintaining muscle, but being able to move with it as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess you, you're very similar. To my stuff's all set up in the garage. Yours is in the back garden, I guess you'd call that, perhaps. And, uh, uh, you know, kind of similar training style, similar similar type of equipment. Um, and I train by myself 99%. I mean, it's always nice when somebody comes by. It kind of motivates me more. But do you, I mean, are you someone that's always trained alone? Or, or is this kind of what you've done recently? Yeah, I mean, I've been training on my own the last 15 years. But I have gone, I've, got, I've gone to gyms, you know, I, when I used to come back uh, to the UK when I was in Switzerland, I'd go to a CrossFit gym, um, but, but basically I train on my own. And that can be quite sort of, that, that can be tough. That has to have its own sort of like, you know, like, like motivation. But, but yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I feel we're very similar in that, that I, I you know, I, I just haven't found people that, you know, I mean, you get a point where people don't want to do the same things you want to do. And then you're kind of like, you know, because everybody might want to bodybuild and you're like, well, I want to do things that are more maybe athletic or functional. Uh, and then, I mean, so you're in Scotland. I mean, it's cold in Scotland. or you know, I, I assume it is. I, when I was I was in Inverness a few years ago, back in 2014 for a world championships in Highland Games uh, where I competed there. And uh, what about do you I mean, outside in the cold rain, shit, rain, snow, whatever. How do you do that? Well, that's what that. I don't live in Scotland. That's where the retreat is. I, I live in the south of England in, okay. in a place called Brighton. Okay. But when I used to live in Switzerland, um, we used to train outside. And I had a group of a group of guys who used to come training with me every day. And we would train outside. And it's a bit of a funny story. But I had, where I lived was a very, very exclusive ski resort. And the people who lived there were quite exclusive people. And they used to come to me and train. And one of my warm-ups was to shovel my garden and clear the snow. <laughs> the funny thing was is that these people are paying uh, other people to clear their drives, their gardens. But they were coming to me, clearing my garden and paying me for it That's as funny. their warm-up. <laughs> That's great. Kind of reminds me of the karate kid type of thing with the waxing the cars and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's and it's good. So we would train in minus sixteen. Yeah, yeah. I find you know for me it's sometimes like it to be like my garage is you know uh, I'd have to think centigrade, but it's you know in the winter time it's twenty degrees, twenty five degrees, thirty degrees Fahrenheit, which is you know below zero centigrade. Some some somewhat can't remember the number exactly. And getting out there and trying to lift heavy was, it, it, it took a while, you know, it took a while to kind of get yeah. warmed up and, you know, I'd, I'd go in there and ride the bike for a while and sprint and put on, you know, heavy clothes and, but you still do it. But it's, you know, like I said, I, I'd much prefer to train in warm, sunny weather for sure. I mean, I don't know if you know. Same here. Yeah. 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 It, it, the wind, the, the winter is tough. Yeah. The, the winter is tough. Yeah. But then the, the, the training changes because of the seasons. As soon as the sun comes out, it's warmer. Yeah, you, you feel better. Yeah, you feel like you can run some sprints and things like that. You know, we're just just now kind of getting where it's a little bit warmer here and, and where I'm at in the kind of Seattle area. But uh, it's kind of often cold and rainy, and so it's, it's it's harder to get outside. You know, particularly when the rain is coming down. But um, and you have a dog. What is his name? Wolf, I think I saw. I his name's mistaken. Wolf. Wolf, yeah, good name for a dog. Is and, and yeah, he eats. I'm assuming an animal, a meat based diet. Or is that? Probably, probably. Yeah. Was, yeah. 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 And how does he do with that? Pretty good. He, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's super healthy. I've never been to the vet with him for anything. Um, he's strong. He's, he'll be seven in October. He's got as much life as you can imagine with a dog. 
he's a fantastic dog. Um, but yeah, he's 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 just a, a raw meat diet. Yeah, I think that. I mean, that's you know, if you think about what wolves eat and dogs are effectively wolves. I mean, with with some with some some breeding. I know I saw it's kind of funny. I I saw Joe Rogan talking to another comic about uh, you know uh, dogs. You know, like little pug dogs used to be wolves, and they've been bred down. And he made the analogy that we're kind of turning turning men into that. We're kind of yeah. men that used to be strong, virile. You know, uh, you know, very very physically capable men into the, the male equivalent of a pug dog, you know, just kind of <laughs> we've lost. And do you see, I mean, let me ask you because, you know, what you do, what I do with people like us, it's becoming, I guess, less and less um, looked up to. I mean, you know, and, and, and when I was a kid, you'd look up to the superheroes that were strong and physically fit. Mm. And now we're sort of like trying not to downplay that as, as, a, as a role model for men. It's more to be the compassionate, soft, gentle yeah uh perhaps intellectual uh softer person uh, are you seeing that are you seeing that as a, as a push in society i've seen it for years you know just with you know with you know with me you know a memory came up on facebook today from 2011 and uh, the headline was back squats funk squats three pounds of sirloin steak, you know, and I used to have people then who would, they were, they were sort of scared of me. And I don't mean it in, in that sense, because it's like, oh, you eat so much meat and like you're, you're too macho and, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's like, yeah, but I'm just being, want to be healthy. I want to be a strong human being. And that was then, that was even before then. And, you know, it's it's not sort of seen as a yeah it's not it's just not respected in if i said to people i'm now a vegetarian and i want to save the planet you know i'd probably get 10 times the amount of followers and friends and etc cetera, etc cetera, you know yeah uh, that's you do you see it seems like we're we're being uh sort of forced culturally to accept weakness and, and to and to sort of demonize, you know, this so-called toxic masculinity, which is obviously nonsense. Um, do you get, I mean, you know, as some guy, cause I know on social media, I mean, generally what I get is very supportive because I, cause I've had an impact on a lot of people's lives and people are happy that they've gotten healthier. And, and I think that's a great service, but then there's, there's the detractors that think, oh, you're so bad for eating meat. How dare you do that? And, oh, just because you're muscular doesn't mean you're healthy. You're clearly sick. You know, do you get some of that? Does that, does that, does anybody kind of bother you with that stuff? I, I, I don't know that you, I know. I mean, I, I don't really get much of it, but I do. And, <clears throat> and I think my stance, if I have a stance, is that what I do, I'm doing for me. You know, a lot of people who want to stand up and, and try and save the world, well, me, I want to save myself because that's the most important thing. Me being strong, being healthy, not to end up, you know, like my parents who are sick, who, you know, and it's hard to say if, if my father was a dog, you know, you'd be thinking like, you know, the best thing for him is to put him down because he's just living in a, in a 24 hour, seven day a week, nightmare that he can't get out of so what i do i do you know for myself you know i'm 58 i'm not 28 you know i just want to be strong i want to show people it's like well you know don't give up when you're 28 when you're 38 when you're 48 it's like be strong now be strong i want to be doing this in 10 years time i want to be in 20 years time i still want to be skiing the slopes i still want to be and I know it sounds a little bit sort of like weird. You know, I want to walk into a place and want someone to say, when I'm 88, well, don't mess with him. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I can remember. Because my grandfather was a, was a very high-level boxer. He was a he was a Golden Gloves champ of Chicago. He fought the, uh, the sort of the undercard fight with, with Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling back in the 19, I think, 30s. I remember my dad said, don't mess with Grandpa. He, when, he, when he was 60, because Grandpa was you know, a high level fighter. And, but I think that is, uh, you know, 
to just want to be able to live. I mean, life should not be about suffering. It should not be about pain and constantly just being sick. And I think anybody that, that that's a fair goal for anybody. It doesn't mean, mean you're selfish or greedy just to not want to nope. be in pain all the time. And I think we, we have people saying, well, how dare you use these resources and how dare you eat so much meat, uh, you know, or something along those lines. And you should save it for the rich guys, you know, save it for Bill Gates and, you know, Klaus Schwab and these guys so they can have it. And everybody else should be doing their part to, to save the planet, which, you know, I think is nonsense, quite honestly. But, um, so with that, with that regard, I mean, how do you feel 48 versus 58? I mean, you feel like you lost much or you're pretty similar or where are you at now? I don't feel any different. I mean, I feel just for today, you know, I feel, you know, I, it's hard to say I feel so, you know, superhuman because people get the wrong impression, but in a way, I do. You know, I seem to feel better as time goes on. You know, with a lot of people are, you know, they get to 30 and they think their life is over. Me, I'm like looking forward to the next, you know, how the next few years unfold. Because I think it's, it's really exciting with, you know, what we're learning about the brain, what we're learning about food, et cetera, et cetera, how we can be, let's call it optimal human beings, you know, rather than, someone who's just like sitting on their ass, pumped full of drugs, um, sick, and basically waiting to die. You know, so I, I don't know how I felt, can't, can't remember how I felt at 48. I mean, at 48, I felt great. You know, but it's, so like you know, 58, I should be feeling not as strong, not as, not as, I can still do exactly the same things, if not better. Yeah. So uh, that, that's, that's really, uh, you know, interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time, like I'm 55, I'm, you know, relatively the similar age. I don't like to compare myself to other 55 year olds because it's, it's, they're awful. I mean, it's like, it's not a good peer group to be in. I'd rather compare myself to a 25 year old or a 30 year old. At least I'm like, you know, it's, 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 it's a better goal for me. If I were, if I wanted to be just better than the average 55 year old, I would be in not a very good place. And so it's not a good comparison. And so it's, it's almost like, we talk about the fountain of youth. I mean, there's, you know, there's, I, I mean, this is it. I mean, I think it is. I mean, maintaining yeah. strength and fitness. And uh, I think diet has a huge role in that. But of course, the training part is is there as well. Um, how much protein are you eating a day? What's, uh, what's, uh, what is the, do you think about that? Or I mean, you have a rough idea what you eat daily, I would imagine. I mean, I don't measure anything, but uh, I would imagine, I would imagine, uh, Two to three hundred grams of protein. Mm -hmm. I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, a fair amount. Yeah, so like a kilo and a half of meat or something like that would be would be yeah. around three hundred grams or something like that. That's that's pretty yeah. simple. I might I might I might even be a little bit more than I I I, I don't know how much you weigh. I'm, do you know what you I mean? You know what you weigh? Any idea? About eighty kilos. 80 kilos. Okay. So I'm about 110, 112 kilos. So I'm a little bit, a little bit taller. Uh, so of course I would eat more. Quite so. a lot taller. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite short. Okay. Well, it's, it's hard to tell on, you know, from an Instagram yeah. post, there's no frame of reference, but, um, you yeah, know, cause a lot of people meet me and they're like, wow, you're taller than I thought you were. Well, I said, well, you know, I, you know, I can't, you know, it, it's hard to tell when you're just seeing somebody by themselves. Um, <clears throat> what has been, uh, for you, uh, you mentioned breath work, uh, and you said the different types of breath work. Could you go into that a little bit? <clears throat> so I've practiced meditation um, for quite a long time. I studied Qigong. Qigong was one of our practices when I was in Japan. Um, and so I've always had an inkling to understand more about breathing, et cetera, et cetera. The problem was, is that a lot of all that stuff was, was shrouded in mysticism, woo-woo stuff. And so you really didn't understand the, the basic part of why am I doing this? What's the benefit? So over the years, I've started to study it a little bit more. And so what I do on a daily basis is just really, really simple. And the, one of the best things, the best book 
I think that I've read was, was last year. Was it last year? The, yeah, I think it was last year. The year was James James Nestor's book, uh, Breathe. And so I just do simple, coherent breath. Um, I do different types of uh, on breathing, just d different types of breathing. But I make a habit of doing it, you know, every day. Box breathing, breath holds. But understanding the understanding the the breath without all the the woo woo connotations with it, and just like understanding like, oh, that's why you do that. That's the benefit of that. And one of the best things that I've um, I mentioned this on the on the uh, I did a podcast with Lily Kane a, a few weeks ago, and one of the best things that I did for my my sleep was I listened to a podcast. I think it was yeah, two, three years ago with Mike Mutzel, and he was talking about mouth taping. So I tried it. And ever since that day, I, every, every day I've, I've, I've taped my mouth, my sleep has been brilliant. But more importantly, is that I've always suffered with, with nightmares and waking up with panics, et cetera, et cetera, and not really understanding why, why that was happening. As soon as I started mouth taping, it all went. And that was just because it, it was stopping the, the dysfunction of, of my jaw when I was sleeping. Yeah, so I mean, again, I assume when you, when you were sleeping, you know, we're breathing through our mouth. We, we, we obviously yep. don't know it because we're asleep. We can't, you know, we can't control that. And so uh, when you first started taping your mouth, was that, was that a problem? I mean, was there like, it didn't feel right? Were there, were there like, I mean, because your body's used to opening its mouth and all of a sudden it can't yep. tapes there. Was there a transition? It was a little bit weird. Yeah. It was a little bit weird, but I persevered with it. You know, it, it, and it's like anything. You know, someone starts a carnivore diet and like after a week they're complaining, or oh, I haven't lost any weight, I haven't done it. It takes time. You have to persevere. You have to make a little bit of a, a sacrifice. So that feeling that I had of not particularly feeling comfortable, I just thought, well, there's something good behind this. So I just kept on with it. And now it's like, feels like normal. Does that carry over to your training? I mean, the, the breath work, do you, do you, do you change the way you breathe? Some people talk about, you know, well, you don't want to breathe through your mouth when you're exercising and, and, you know, do you focus on that or does that, do you might worry about that during those times? Sometimes I try, but sometimes it's quite difficult and it's almost like it becomes like another complication. It becomes like another, uh, distraction. So, and I think the important thing with with breath work, with training, is the re once you finish the training, is how you recover your breath after that. So, you know, it's it's really difficult um, to for me to think about my breath when I'm doing a workout. I mean, I'm doing a, a load of burpees at the moment. Yeah, and, I know. and that's really yeah. Well, I was going to say, there's a couple people commenting in the comments I was reading, and they said they all have been taping, and it's, 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 it's been improvement improvement for them. Do you, do you find, I'm just wondering if after a period of taping for three months, six months, your body gets used to it, and then you don't need to tape anymore? Or, is it, or does anybody see that where you just get so used to breathing through your nose that you, your mouth doesn't open and it's sleep? Well, it could, it could be that you've retrained your mouth not to open, and, and the jaw has been retrained not to not to fall back. So, but I think the times that I, I've forgotten to put it on, I haven't had a bad sleep, but that's been minimal. Maybe in the last two years, a half a dozen times. How do your lips do? <laughs> Does it be yeah, that can be, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I've just pulled it off without thinking and it's, it's not pleasant. Yeah, I know because you're carrying a beard and a mustache, and so it's got to be you got to be careful. And what I mean, are you finding there are certain types of tape that work better? I mean, you just stick some scotch scotch on there, or some electric tape, or is there specific brands that you have to use? Micropore 3M. So that's the one that's almost it's almost like a it's almost like a cloth feel to it because some are too plasticky, and those are the ones that really sort of like rip your lips. So simple 3M Micropore. Yeah, a couple of people are commenting on the 3M tape being well, being good. So that's that's I may experiment with that just for 
just for fun. I haven't, I haven't played with that. I, you know, I, I know, I would say I've seen guys like uh, Vim Hoff. I'm sure you're familiar with his popularized breathing as a, as a, as a tool for health. And there's other people that have been, you know, obviously this isn't new. This has been around for uh, thousands of years, I would imagine yeah. different type of breathing techniques. Um, and then, but interesting, go ahead. sorry, interestingly with Wim Hof is that what I've noticed with him is that in the beginning, when he was talking about his breathing, his breath work, everything was, was through the mouth. And then over the last couple of years, because there's been more, more people posting about uh, nasal breathing, he's now sort of talking about doing his type of breathing through the nose. So in the beginning, it was all about through, 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 through the mouth. So he's, he's been, there's been a change there with what he's uh, putting out, which I've noticed. Yeah, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of strange because we can breathe through our mouth. I mean, it's yeah. doable, but I just don't know. I mean, just wonder why do you, why do you have a mouth that you can breathe through if you're not supposed to breathe through it? Uh, you know, I'm just, just trying to figure, you know, trying to play the devil's advocate a little bit. I know because when I was, Rowing, I you know I, I was able to be fairly high level on, on rowing and set some world records on that Concept Two machine, and people would would say, well, you need to breathe through your nose when you're doing it, and I'm like, look, I'm pulling world record paces here. I'm doing what I have to do to to because you can I think you can you can take in more volume of breath through your mouth, you know when you yeah rowing. I think I think for I think for that type of that type of work, I mean it's going to be really difficult to 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 breathe, and I'm no expert. I mean I'm not an academic, but what I do know is that. When it goes through the nose, because if you look at the nose, you, it, it, it filters out so much crap. Right. Sure. You know, it, it humidifies, it pressurizes the, is, you know, the, you know, the, the, air, the air. So, and then there's the nitric oxide production. So it stimulates that in the parasinus. And then, then that's a vasodilator. So then that opens up airways, et cetera. So doing nasal breathing while I'm sleeping that to me is like that's that's a clear benefit, and especially over the last couple of years with with COVID, when we would walk past people and we'd hold our breaths, all this all this type of stuff. Breathing through the nose was was the like a way for me to think I can filter out all the crap, all the, the viruses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I mean, I. I just really didn't worry about that too much, quite honestly. I mean, we, you know, you, you're you're breathing in a million viruses right now. I we've talked, we've all breathed in, you know, millions of viruses, and we we didn't generally handle those types of things. Um, what has been the biggest change for you since you went sort of almost fully animal based? Have you noticed anything that stuck out to you as far as recovery ability, strength, uh, better sleep, better anything? I think I, I personally just think it's just been my men, the mentality, how I think, how I operate, how I deal with with stress, um, and just like the vigor that I have. But I think I, I, yeah, I think I think I think uh, mentally that's probably been the the, the the biggest change because I know when I eat crap. And I don't eat crap hardly at all, but when I do, I feel shit. You know, not just not just physically, but how I think about stuff. You know, for me, when I'm eating just meat, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I feel good. I feel, my thinking is clear or clearish. Um, so I just, and I feel on top of it. There's a question uh, somebody makes. I thought you were out there in Scotland. That's my mistake. But they're asking about: Do you do any kind of uh, thermal stress, cold heat, sauna, cold plunge, any of that stuff? Is that part of your routine at all? Well, interesting. I bought uh, a far infrared sauna a few weeks ago. It was like a little birthday present for, for, for myself because I'd, I'd seen people mentioning it. I found out which was the one to get, and and I started. Uh, using it about two months ago. Now, and I pretty much used it every day. I can't say that I feel any real difference. You know, and lots of people say, oh, this is amazing. You've got to try that. I can't say that I feel much different, but it feels nice to sweat a bit. It feels nice to have some heat, but 
other than that, I can't really say it's helped me. I, I can't say I feel stronger. I feel more mentally alert. Um, I, I find for me, and I've got a sauna that, I, that we just put in, and I, I find for me, it's just kind of like another workout. I mean, I sweat, I get hot, it raises my pulse rate, my, you know, uh, probably, you know, it just does all, it has a very fit physiologically similar effect to just doing a workout. So it may be a way to just kind of get another workout in without, you know, some of the stuff that comes with it. Uh, I've yeah. got a red light thing. And I think I noticed, you know, if I'm being fair, the thing I could notice is I, I seem like I slept a little better. If I did that at night, you know, nighttime, you know, close to bed, I would, I would sleep a little better. So maybe I was just intentionally mindful about trying to get a good night's sleep, you know, and it's like, I'm the, cause when you focus on that and you just say, I want to work on sleep, you tend to get better sleep. So maybe some placebo effect there. The Scott. So the, the second retreat, when is that going to occur? Where is that going to be? Is, is it sold out? What's the deal on that one? Well, I've just started actually posting uh, this morning. There's a, things, a couple of things I've got to just confirm with the, the lodge owners, but it's going to be in October uh, this year. And you said you went to, when you were doing the competition, you went to Inverness. Right. Well, if you, if you go west from Inverness for one hour, that's where, that's, that's where in the middle of nowhere. Um, so that's gonna, it's going to be in October. October the seventh to the eighth, and then so just, a, just a weekend. Then basically, a couple two days. It's a week. Oh, you said seven through the, through the, the second. Sorry, second through the eighth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how many people are you anticipating, or do you have capacity for? Well, I'm having a, a limit of six people, or eight people, if there's two couples. Okay, and and the similar plan to the last time is going to be exercise, meditation, breathing, walking, eating a bunch of steak, and and that type of stuff, I suppose. Exactly how I live my life. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounds like fun. I, I would do. I would. That's something I would be happy. To, that, that sounds like a good vacation to me. I mean, like I said, I. I uh, that, that's kind of how I live my life anyway. So that's my kind of my day to day as well. It's in a, it's in the middle of a of a hunting of a hunting estate. Yeah. So you'll see all, you'll see the deer on the you know, on the mountains. Um, the picture behind me is the lock next door. Okay, yeah. that's it. You're not far from Loch Loch Ness. Uh, I mean, I know Loch Ness was not far from Inverness. I know I toured there. When Loch, I was... Yeah, Loch Ness is about half an hour away. Yeah. So in case some, hopefully the monster doesn't get people. <laughs> Is a hunting so it's an I mean you mentioned ex hunting lodges. What is the status of hunting in the UK? Is it is it outlawed? Is it very restricted? Or what, what is the deal on hunting there? I'm probably not the best person to to, to ask, but there's there's like the, there's a hunting season. So they will hunt uh, the big estates in Scotland, the UK will have a hunting season. Um and it's 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 a fairly it's a fairly big thing. Let me ask you one other question because your your handle on Instagram is Mason Survival. Yeah, survival. Does that are you a survivalist or where where does that come from? Where does where does the survival part come from? Right. So when I was in Israel, when I was uh, learning Krav Maga, and back then it was, I think back back then in the eighties when we didn't have any. Google and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I remember talking to some guys and they said the best guys in Israel, the best proponents of Krav Maga is this group called Dan Survival. And Dan in, in Israel is, is quite a common name. And it, it, this was 1988, this stuck with me. And so when I decided to give myself a, a brand name, I just thought Mason survival. So it has nothing to do with being a survivalist. It's just, it's just from an old memory that sort of still sticks in my, in my mind. Cause it, cause then it was like, it was like you look to think, Oh my God, this is, this, I've got to find these Dan survival people. I see. And then just one other thing on, on this, on the, uh, uh, the retreat, do you have martial arts? Is that something that anyone has an interest in and in learning some of that? I mean, I assume you, taught at some point correct i mean given the high level that you were at i mean i taught i've, I've taught for what i what i do teach on the retreat is uh some qigong breathing practices some standing qigong 
you know, things like, you know, and things like that. And I'll go through why we do it, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of full on martial arts, then no. Unless someone wants to say, can you show me a weapon disarm in the lounge? And I may do. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Michael, this has been very, very uh, fun. This has been good to get to know you and, and learn from you. I unfortunately have to shut this down. I've got to do some consults in a few minutes. And so we'll let people know where to go to find you. I mean, Mason Survival on Instagram, is, there, is, there, is, there a place, is that the best place to find you? Mason Survival on Instagram. Well, I look forward to seeing, seeing what you're up to and look forward to the, the food you're cooking and the workouts. It's, it's, like I said, it's a source of inspiration for me as well. And so keep doing what you're doing. And I, look, I wish you well on the uh, retreat. I assume if somebody wants to find out where the retreat is, they can find it from your Instagram as well, correct? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be it'll be in my bio. But just just send me just send me a DM, and I can I can tell them all about it, and they can ask me whatever questions they want to. Sounds great. All right, well, everybody, I gotta go. Thank you so much. We'll see everybody tomorrow. You guys take care, Michael. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye bye, guys.